Okay, welcome everyone to our <laughs> Mestizo Roundtable. We'll be reporting on our experiences growing up Mestizo or our observations of others growing up Mestizo, developing as Mestizos and how being Mestizo has affected our lives and who we are now. The first speaker will be Maria Stroud from, uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. Maria has written a well-received book about her father's journey back in the early 1900s from the Philippines to America to become a medical doctor. And we'll be hearing about Maria's experiences growing up mestizo as the daughter of a prominent Filipino medical doctor working in a white community in Wisconsin. Maria. Okay. I, you've shared the, the thing with me, I think. And I can be able to see that now. Now you can see it? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Alvarez Stroud. And um, as Richard said, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm going to um, speak ab about this in, in two ways, as the daughter of a Spanish Filipino mestizo, and then also as, as me being the first generation in, um, in Wisconsin, which I, I think um, might be a little unique story <laughs> about being Spanish Filipino in Norwegian, at least hopefully it will be. So meet my father, R Ricardo Venuza Alvarez. He was born um, in 1895, as you see. Um, he grew up in a, in a city called uh, Santa Cruz, uh, Laguna. Many of you probably know that city. I don't think it was very, very large at, and when he was a small boy. Um, as you can see, he looks very Spanish. And you're probably all noticing, I don't look very Spanish or <laughs> I look probably more Norwegian to you than anything. But, I, I used to look um, a lot more like my father. He, um, his father was a Spaniard, full-blooded Spaniard coming from the Philippines or coming from Spain and married into um, a very large clan, Filipino clan. And so his mother was Filipino. Um, these are just pictures of him on, on his journey. And I, I don't wanna go into great detail, but um, when he was three years old, he, he had a very nice life. I mean, his family was comfortable. Um, they were right in the heart of Santa Cruz. And um, he lived very close to his Lola, his grandmother, that was right across from the cathedral that she really supported her whole life financially, emotionally, um, volunteer-wise. And so it was very good. But everything changed um, when he was three years old. Um, when the, the first war started, the Spanish-American War. And uh, I, again, when you can look at these pictures, you can know um, if my father looked like this, his, his father looked even more Spanish. He towered over most Filipinos, but he was very involved with the, Filip with the, the community in Santa Cruz. He was the pharmacist. But even during the first war, um, they, like many others, went and hid in the hills um, for fear of, of their own lives. Now, his Lola was very supportive of that war and welcomed people in. Um, it changed dramatically in the second war. This, at this point, my father's seven years old. And um, this is where her, her family home was almost destroyed. It was taken over by the Americans and the church across the street was also just about destroyed. Through the encouragement of her Lola, in fact, uh, it was part of the reason he said he needed to get on a ship and, and go to America. And she financially supported him to do that. It's, it's a key. I mean, this is where he wasn't having money worries like so many other Filipinos were having. Um, but he didn't know, like his family has said, if he would find a place under the new leadership of Americans. So he boarded that ship and Rather than um, what many Filipinos did, he didn't stop in California. In fact, he almost turned around. In first class quarters, there were not very many Filipinos. He didn't know much English. He didn't feel welcomed by many. And, um, and so he was wanting to turn around and go back, but only by the grace of God in some ways, 
um, and this a fellow Filipino and his wife, he went on to Chicago. So this is what Chicago looked like in 1916. Um, I, I you, can, you can see very crowded. It was filled with Northern um, Europeans, almost um, the entire population in Chicago were, were new immigrants in fact. Um, so he couldn't see himself walking down the street. Um, he didn't, there were, at that time, the number of, of Filipinos were estimated to be about 220 in the city of 2 million um, in Chicago. So I, I would say this is the first time he really, really felt true discrimination, um, a lack of, lack of belonging. Um, he was not able to go into many restaurants or establishments, but only dance in a dance hall, only for, for colored people. So I, I think he went through a lot and I could talk a long time about the tribulations and the trials that he went through. But the, the truth is he found his way and, um, and it, in surprising, he landed in a very little town about, um, about 750 people at the time in Wisconsin. Mm. And, <laughs> and surprising as that may be, I think he had to create his own community and again, as Filipinos, we all know community and family is everything. And they, there was uh, very few. In, when he went to medical school in Milwaukee, in fact, he was the only um, non-white person in his medical class that they graduated from his class. He, so it's a good news story. And I have to say that you know he found the woman also to marry a, a woman that was in nursing school at the time who became my mother. I say they were a courageous couple because she was a small farm girl, uh, Protestant, not Catholic like him. So um, again, there, there, there's a lot that could be said about that. So that's the background to me. And let's fast forward um, to me growing up in small Galesville, Wisconsin, all Norwegians, Germans, and some Filipinos. You can probably pick me out in, in, these, in these pictures. Um, and I have to say, I'm gonna describe this in three different chapters. The first chapter for me was mostly unaware. I knew I looked different. Um, as you can see me looking at the people <laughs> at a birthday party I was at, I knew I looked different, but I didn't feel different. I knew my father spoke with a heavy accent, but he, was, he had patients that admired him and people were always kind. Um, not so kind in that I, you know, I didn't feel it in certain ways. My brother and I have strong memories of three schools came together when we were um, in, you know, going, entering into kindergarten and no one wanted to play with us from those other schools. It took a while for them to, you know, get used to the fact that we did look different than, than everybody else. In high school, you know, I took it in, in stride. I, it's not that I wasn't part of the whole mix, but um, when you get called names like Aunt Shemima or Black Banana, when you wear, <laughs> when you wear a yellow dress or, um, uh, black beauty. I, I again. I was becoming more aware of um, of me being different. And then, of course, um, I went off to college. And one of the things that happened, and I'll I'll, I'll address this mistake in identities um, first, is that I really became aware of being different because I was no longer in that protected environment. This is where I got mistaken for being everything but Asian, uh, Black, Native American, Latino, Latino from just about anywhere. <laughs> and that, um, that was disturbing to me. I, I guess I just didn't, again, I didn't understand it. And I realized, I, I was starting to realize I, I didn't know enough about my background. Um, that changed when I turned 17, um, before I went to college. And my family, my father, my mother, and my twin brother, and I went to the Philippines. And that was an aha moment for me. It was a, probably the time when I went, who, I looked at my father speaking Tagalog and Spanish and going, who, who are you? And in that same vein, who am I? And what have I been missing here? Because this is family. I, I, I discovered such a world I, I didn't know. And I was really happy to do that. I think the next chapter for me then was the seed was planted, you know, I needed to know more. I started to pay attention to, to the family in the Philippines, to, I started doing some reading. I, I actually was already a, a nut about reading historical fiction. 
And I, I, it took me almost until I was retired to really take the time to do the research. Um, and last year, this, the, the book Brave Crossing um, came out. And I have to say, I, I say here, discovery to activism. And my discovery was about me and not just my father, which was really incredible <clears throat> characteristics I didn't understand. Um, that sense of family, I didn't really understand um, all, so many things. Uh, and I discovered family in the Philippines. And this is a picture from um, three years ago when I went to a family reunion of about 350. And, and there's, there's thousands of uh, relatives that I haven't met yet. Um, but just that sense that I really do um, belong. And I really took it to activism in that I've been doing a lot of book events in the last year. And they started out doing just being book events. And what I've done is really shifted that to now a, a combination of a book event slash workshop. And the workshop is, I, I named it Knowing Our Own. Um, by sharing my father's story, I now am using tools that I've created and gleaned from other historical novelists um, that they can start looking at their own history and their ancestors in a different way. If, if they're like my father, he never spoke about his journey. And um, now, you know, I'm, I, I can say both of my kids have read my book and I'm really glad. And I'm now focused on writing a book about the, the other side of the coin, my mother's um, journey as well. Um, I have to say too, that I also was, have been fortunate to find my place. I never once felt discriminated, uh, only open hands and open arms in Madison, Wisconsin. And I, I think that's a, the piece that was, I didn't realize um, growing up is that that's what we all need is a place to belong and that the, our, all of our journeys are different. So that's my story in a nutshell. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, if, you know, if, if someone has one. Thank you. I think we'll save the questions for the end. Yeah. Question. So thank you, Maria. Very interesting. Okay, I'm calling it picking peas in Pescadero because that is where my parents met, a place called Pescadero, and you'll be seeing that. My father came from Sinai to Sur in the northern Philippines, 1925, and landed in San Francisco. My mother was in Guthrie, Oklahoma, and her family left Oklahoma with the dust bowl, the, the dust storms accompanying the drought. And most of the Okies, so-called, that left Oklahoma, ended up going to California looking for farm work. And here's Pescadero on the coast from where they met. Pescadero is located about 40 miles south of San Francisco on the coast. When my mother's family got there, they were set up in a kind of a lean-to, something like this. And in the tea fields, in addition to the people coming from the Dust Bowl, there were Filipinos working and probably Mexicans as well. I'm not sure, but there were a lot of Filipinos and, and whites mixed in the field. And that is where my mother and father met in the tea field. The Filipinos differed from most of the other pea pickers in that after work, they put on fancy clothes. And in this picture, the woman on the furthest left is my aunt Lenore. And next to her, my grandmother, Lily. And next to her, my mother, Marie. So among these Filipinos was one named Nick Tamaza from uh, Sinai Tilokasur. My mother's ancestry is 100% European, according to Ancestry.com and my analysis. She's German, Welsh, English, Scotch, and Swedish. Her dad was 100% Ilocano. So you mix the European and the Ilocano, and out comes Richard, who wasn't a 50 year gestation, it was 50 years later. I grew up <clears throat> associating with my mother's side of the family. And my, on the left is my mother and my aunt and my sister, Dorothy and I. And the right, my father and some of his friends, the 
Filipino part of the equation. 1946, I moved with some of my siblings to San Francisco to live with my aunt and grandmother. And from then on, we were in San Francisco during the school year and in Stockton where my mother who had divorced my, my father and remarried another Filipino was living. So we'd spend <clears throat> off school seasons in, in the, around Stockton and school in San Francisco. I became sort of Mexican during that time. And my friend Pete Nava and I on the left and my first girlfriend, Rosemary on the, the right. So most of the time I was hanging out with Mexican kids outside of, of school during those years. We got used to being stopped and carted and searched by police. It was just a routine part of growing up the way that we did in San Francisco. And also being followed around in supermarkets was part of the regular routine. It, it was aggravating. I didn't realize how different it was until I was in college and was hanging out with people who were with uh, people that were whiter and saw that not everybody was treated the same way. This is an incident that stayed with me forever. My, this is my father, but actually the new person involved is my stepfather. We were in San Jose and he was stopped for a traffic infraction of some sort. I don't know what it was in downtown San Jose. And the officer said to him, what nationality are you? And my father said, I'm Filipino, sir. And the officer has answered, I could understand if you were some dumb Mexican, but a Filipino boy should know better. And that was bad. We were called names on occasion. My mother wanted to buy a house close to the University of Pacific in Stockton, buy or rent a house house because we're where my stepfather was farming was not far from there in the, out in the country but she found that though she was white she could not rent or purchase a house in that area because her husband was filipino so white women married to filipinos suffered a lot in california at least one of the worst experiences that i had was in third grade a spelling test we had one teacher for low third the high third grade a new teacher came in and apparently she didn't like me. So one day she had a spelling contest and we put out a word like disappointment and asked people to raise their hands and try to spell it. And I kept raising my hand, raising my hand. Finally, she ran out of people and nobody could spell it. And I spelled it and I was feeling really proud until we got her response, which was, he thinks he's smart. And that absolutely, uh, crushed me. I was having a hard time in school anyway because of his going to five different schools by the time I was in second grade. But this one teacher really put a damper on, on things for me. In college, sometime later, I ran into another problem, which was that of parents of white women not wanting their daughters to date Filipinos. And you know, one case was very, very specific. And of course, the, the women were very upset about it. They were a little bit older than this one is made out to be. Another interesting experience. I'm just going through some of the, some of the things reflecting, I think, uh, racial prejudice that I experienced. And this was another one. I gave a lecture about 1985 to the Daughters of the American Revolution group, which at that time was practically 100% white. Now it's gotten more diverse and this might not happen. But after my lecture, a woman came up to me and said, you speak English pretty well. And I said, well, I should, I, I was born here. And she said, well, I guess that helps. This is my dad and I, and this is another strange thing that happened. We were in Seattle, I don't, know, I don't remember the exact year, but it was late at night and we wanted to get a motel and my dad and his his, his, his wife, who was Mexican, and I you know, pulled up to a motel and I went in to see if there were rooms and there were rooms available. So I, you know, I wanted to rent two rooms. I went out and got my, my dad and stepmom. We came back in and suddenly they had no rooms when they saw my dad and stepmom. So we, you know, I made a mistake, they don't have any rooms. So we left and went to Chinatown in Seattle to, to stay in a hotel there. 1967, my life changed when I went to Thailand. I was hired by the army to do something in Thailand. 
And suddenly I was surrounded by people that looked like me and liked me because of the way I looked. And not only that, they loved Filipinos in Bangkok, at least because of all the Filipino entertainers. So suddenly from a place from where Filipinos were despised by many to a place where people loved Filipinos. For years, I had strange dreams about animals like these. And you think about that and figure out why. So in conclusion, the racial prejudice that I experienced was due to my dark non-European phenotype, not my mestizo genotype. People were get going against me specifically because I was mestizo, but because I looked different and from the average white person. <clears throat> In my own mind and body, I had problems being mestizo because of some confusion over my identity and internalized oppression, which is adopting or starting to believe in stereotypes put forth by a domineering <clears throat> group over a, a subjected group and assuming that they, what the domineering group is saying is <clears throat> are putting forth is the truth about the oppressed group. The only example I can think of of Mestizos being discriminated against specifically for being Mestizo involves other Filipinos. And after the 1965 immigration, especially there, I think it's becoming less common now, but it was very common for it to be speaking to somebody from the Philippines, a later immigrant from the Philippines who would say, well, you're not really Filipino, you're Mestizo, or you're not Filipino, you don't speak the language and things like that. And that was that was the worst discrimination that I, that I ever saw with regard to uh, just being mestizo. Otherwise, the discrimination that I experienced was something that was ex expressed against all dark people, I believe, and not mestizo specifically. Thank you. Okay, so my, I had a totally different um, experience because I, I'm from a different uh, generation and um, a, a different era. So um, I, was, I was born in 1959. I have a twin sister. Um, and um, my grandfather was the one from the Philippines. And he was real proud that there were twins in his uh, family now. So my grandparents, um, uh, Mother, grandmother was from Spain. Grandfather was from the Philippines. They met here in Stockton and got married in Stockton in 1924. Um, my mom uh, was half Filipino and half Spanish. And my father was from Peru. And they met down in uh, Mexico. Uh, there was a uh, an international conference there where people from different countries came together to teach each other different uh, aspects of different professions. She was there for nursing. He was there for education. So they met, they got married in Mexico City, and then they got married here in California because my mom wanted to make sure it was legal. So um, eventually he went back to Peru, and we never heard from him again. So growing up, we were raised by my divorced working mother, uh, mostly in, in Stockton. We moved to Stockton in 63, and we were raised by my uncles and aunts, and um, and our cousins really were like our brothers and sisters because we were all so close. Um, they wanted to look after us very well. Um, so my grandfather had gone back to the Philippines after his first wife died, married someone uh, from the Philippines, from his hometown, and had four more children. He had four from the first wife and now four from the second wife. So we were very mixed, um, very mixed. And it didn't make any difference to any of us. We didn't really, you know, dwell on that. I never had any problems or challenges of being a, a, a mixed race because uh, there were a lot of different races in our elementary to high school. I never got called any names based on race. Everybody just, you know, picked on you 
for your weight, basically, or if you were a nerd or something. Um, and I didn't think most people knew what we were anyway. My last name, Taurus, so maybe they thought we were Mexican, but they didn't, you know, tease us uh, on that. So there were other Filipinos in my class, because Stockton, um, there was a lot of Filipinos here. A lot of mixed people too, but I didn't see them as Filipinos. I just saw them as my classmates. So I didn't really think about it that way. I, I, we were just people. So the only thing I thought was different was that I didn't have a father. So, and that I had a twin. So, you know, that's the only thing I thought was different. So the genotype, phenotype, you know, like I said, my mother's Filipino and Spanish and According to DNA, a little Chinese in there, and the father was from Peru, and he had Italian and, and Quechua India, Indian in there. So DNA says we also have French and Portuguese and all that. Um, so if I have to check a box, usually I either check white or Hispanic, because usually there, there was no box for Filipino, and I, I just didn't, you know, it was just quicker. So I didn't even think about that. Um, I knew we were Filipino because, and we went to Filipino events, but I didn't classify it as Filipino events. This was just an event that the family was going to. There are my relatives. Oh, well, it turns out it was a, a Filipino fiesta or Filipino party, but this was Stockton. So, you know, everybody, anytime we went anywhere, it was a Filipino event, but I didn't <laughs> see it as that as kids. It was just going someplace where we're going to have a good time and we're going to see our relatives and we're going to eat some food. And at Christmas time, we were going to get some presents. So uh, we did have Filipino food at home if my mom. Oh, so. OK, sorry. Uh, so anyway, going to festivals because it was Stockton, there's a lot of Filipinos there. But I didn't realize that that was a significance that there's all these Filipinos here because it's Stockton. It, it was just people we knew, just families. So I only began to focus on being Filipino when I joined Fonz. And the only reason why I joined Fonz is because my aunts and uncles wanted their history of their father to be told and not forgotten. But because of Fonz, then I learned, oh, there's a reason why there's so many Filipinos in Stockton. There's a reason why my grandfather went to Hawaii when he left in 1913. There's a reason why he came to California and worked in the fields. And there's a reason why eventually he became a labor contractor. He had all these businesses on, in what now people were calling Little Manila. So I learned all of that stuff just because of joining Fonz. I mean, I knew he did those things, but I didn't know it was significant. And um, I had no idea it was significant uh, why when they bought land in 1930, it was in his wife's name and not his name. So then when she died in 1935, it passed to her four kids who were only 10 years old to three years old. They became, you know, landowners. And, you know, I didn't know why. I didn't know any of that, th those things. And so I learned it all through Fonz. And so that's why I'm interested now in this Filipino American history in, you know, why uh, it's so important. So that's why I'm here. That's it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lois Magaway Sahum. Let's see. I, I'm, you know, I used to have staff do this for me, so I'm learning. Okay. My life story, and I'll start out. I was born and raised in Ketchikan, Alaska, uh, when Alaska was still a territory of the United States. And it didn't become a state until 1958. But my hometown was 
known as the first city to Alaska and also famous as the uh, capital for salmon. My brother and I uh, were the only Filipino children in our community. It was a small community of several thousand. Uh, the economic base there was the fishing industry and the lumber industry. And my family were fishermen and miners and also worked at our local pulp mill which was the largest uh, lumber industry and company in uh, southeastern Alaska. My family, uh, I am half Filipino and half Norwegian. And on the, my father, this is a picture of him. He uh, immigrated along with his brother, my uncle Fernando in the early 1920s. They are from the northern part of the Philippines, uh, a city called Bacara Ilocos Norte. Both he and my uncle uh, came by ship to Hawaii and they stayed there several years working in the Hawaiian pineapple plantations. Then they continued on to California after that, but they went to an area in uh, Half Moon Bay where farming agriculture was there and they worked in the fields. My um, father didn't stay long in California. He was able to join the United States Coast Guard and he had his training in Louisiana and his first assignment was he was stationed in Ketchikan, Alaska, where there is a Coast Guard base. So he was there during World War II. My uncle Fernando came to Lathrop, California, where there was a large uh, population of Filipinos that far farmed. And on two roads in Lathrop, Manila Road and Briggs Road, were many of their compadres from Bacara Ilocos Norte. My uh, other, my white side of the family, the Norwegian side of the family, this is my mother on the left-hand side, and my grandparents, their wedding picture. They, uh, my mother uh, worked, uh, she was an artist, worked uh, with disabled people in the arts area. My grandparents, my grandfather was a fisherman. They owned a trawler. They fished during the fishing season for salmon, halibut. And my grandmother worked in the canneries. And this is where I uh, first saw other Filipinos was the cannery workers that came to work in my hometown. We had several canneries there and many of them, many of the workers there were from Stockton. My father knew the ones that lived in Stockton and also the ones that had traveled from the Lathrop area there. So he would always take my brother and I to the canneries to meet these Filipino men. And on weekends, they would have big gatherings where they cooked Filipino food. That was the first time I ever tasted Filipino food. And uh, later on in my life, when I did finally come to California, I would meet up with some of the Filipino men that worked in there that family, but this is my total Norwegian family, my aunt and my uncles. So I went to a school that was all white. Uh, the only other ones besides my brother and me were the Alaska 
native Indians, and I am also 116th Tlingit, and that is one of the tribes, two tribes that dominate southeastern Alaska, the Tlingit and the Haida tribes. And it was on my grandmother's side, she was uh, half Tlingit Indian. But so I ventured to California and my first time to visit California was in 1959. So the first, it was like stepping into a new world. And those of you that have been to Alaska, it's quite, the landscape is quite different from Stockton, California. It was the first time for me to see flat ground, no mountains, the heat, and not to, to be surrounded by water and other natural resources that were readily available to us. And then uh, even the type of housing you had here was different. We only had one main, we only had one main road in our city. We didn't have any large grocery stores or clothing we had to order. So seeing all of these new types of businesses were new to us. And uh, of course the weather was quite different. So we had to adapt to that. But the cultural differences that we noticed weren't, were, I had never seen a black person, a Chinese person. I had Japanese people. We had Japanese uh, ships that came to our town that would collect uh, from the canneries, the waste like fish heads and that type of thing to ship back to Japan. But also, so, it was really a very uh, learning experience, but an exciting learning experience because it was so new. Not only learning about the Filipino culture, but all these other cultures, uh, tasting their food, going to their advance. And uh, the Filipino culture, we did meet my father's side and all of his friends, and they were just so warm and welcoming to us that um, I felt like I was at home and I could, uh, and I, I identified with them in that way because they were very warm, uh, warm people. And the way they welcomed my brother and me, uh, we couldn't have asked for more. Uh, the one thing, I, I think they wanted to learn about us too, including the other cultures. Um, it was the first time they ever met kids from Alaska. So uh, I can remember uh, we were asked to speak before a class and the first questions asked of me was what it was like to live in an igloo did I eat whale blubber? And, um, oh, how many dogs did I have to a dog sled team? That, uh, we found that very amusing. So it was very mutual. Kids getting to us, know us, and we getting to know them. But discovering my other half was, um, it was a major part of my life that I really uh, welcomed because um, particularly getting to know the history of Stockton and the Filipino community. My dad never shared any information with us in Alaska about Stockton, only about town mates. He never shared any uh, customs, any of that. But he was very active in Alaska, very active in the community, particularly the American Legion and events that they had throughout the year. 
so, but I, I, we always wondered why he never uh, told us anything, not even about his background in the Philippines. So I never knew uh, who his parents were or grandparents, only that he had this brother. So when I did come to Stockton and started learning the history, I learned a lot of the history from his brother. His brother was one of those Filipinos that uh, did not marry, stayed single because of that law and was alone. And he lived in that area in downtown Stockton that many referred to as Skid Row. And I had never even heard the word Skid Row before. And I remember the first time I rode through Skid Row, I couldn't, uh, I, it was totally new to me. I had never seen that kind of area. And my, uh, later when I was a little uh, older in my early 20s, my uh, uncle, he lived in one of those old downtown hotels. And I just could not stand him living there anymore. It was uh, just the surroundings were not uh, desirable at all. So from that time on, I took care of him for 24 years. I wouldn't allow him to go back to living alone like that and under those kind of conditions. So working, not only learning the history of Stockton and the Filipino community, but I became involved in government work and was in it for 42 years. I never experienced any discrimination the whole time I worked in government, uh, but I did learn from my uncle what he did experience. During World War II, he used to tell me that the buses would come from the islands out in the Delta, Bacon Island and some of those islands to bring the Filipino farm laborers in to buy uh, goods for the wheat. And he told me they had to wear little signs on their lapels of their shirts saying that they were Filipino, not Japanese, because many of his fellow farm labor workers would get beat up. And then also he would tell me that there were certain stores they couldn't go in. And uh, I personally later experienced with him uh, when I took him to an eye appointment and the way he was treated and uh, that, that saddened me. And uh, I never wanted him to experience that again. So I never had him go back to that eye doctor again. But part of my experience and living the rest of my life here was recognizing the good similarities between the cult, Filipino culture and the culture I grew up knowing. There were more similarities than differences. And so I felt that that made me, uh, that made me a better person, not only uh, in uh, my work in government work, but with my family, uh, friends everywhere. So I've always appreciated being from both cultures. And one thing, um, when I look back at all of those years, and I've been in California now, but I, I'm grateful that I have two homes, Alaska and California. I'm grateful that I am Filipino, but I am Norwegian too. And when I look at it, I'm the part of the bridge generation, the offspring of the immigrants, the first immigrants here, 
but and so since that time there's been four generations and so when i look at the four generations to me it's diversity at its best when i just look at my family that has grown these years from the time my father immigrated here we have we're Filipino, Norwegian, Tlingit, German, English, African-American, Middle Eastern, Danish, and Swedish. So I feel very blessed. That's the end of my pre presentation. Okay, thank you, Lewis. And who's next up, is it Al? Okay. Anyway, um, <clears throat> my name is Al Falan. I was born in uh, I was born in uh, Stockton, California, in 1946. Uh, my uh, my parents. Uh, we'll start with uh, how I uh, how I came to <laughs> to be uh, an American here. My father came from uh, Sinai to Locusor in the Philippines uh, about 1925. The time's not particularly exact. Um, Part of the uh, time he uh, he did go to Hawaii and have to spend some time uh, in Hawaii working in uh, the Hawaiian pineapple fields and plantation. And finally, he was able to, uh, after some time, uh, leave that. And I'm not sure if he assumed someone else's identity to be able to make the trip and get on the ship or uh, he was able to keep his own uh, his own identity. As far as uh, age goes, there's some discrepancy as to what his real age was. Uh, and it's my understanding that uh, there was some misrepresentation of age uh, for him and others uh, so that they could uh, qualify in some way, shape, or form at the time to get on the ship and, and make their way toward the United States. Um, my father was from uh, Sinai Locusor in the Philippines, and uh, there were uh, 11 brothers and sisters, a large family, but um, uh, some of the family was uh, pawned out to be raised by the grandparents and, and others, I, I understand. And uh, so he was the youngest of the brothers. He only had one other brother who, uh, who came to the United States and stayed with him and who became a minister. He had a third brother who made his way to the United States, but uh, his he drove a cab. He made it. He made it to New York, and he drove a cab in New York, and uh, he had a bit of a hot temper, and he didn't like people tooting at him. And as I understand it, he carried an asparagus knife under the seat, and uh, so as a result of a altercation, he was. Um, he was uh, put, put in jail and my father's mother uh, asked, uh, sent another brother to the United States to bring him home so he would not get in any trouble. So I was fortunate in, in that sense that I did have another uncle who did come here. Uh, but I, before I get into that, I'm gonna talk about my mother. My mother was a, a blue-eyed blonde Caucasian uh, she came from the Midwest. She was uh, in a chosen field of the ministry. And my father, uh, having landed in San Francisco, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the, gent, uh, the genteel ways of San Francisco gentry and, and uh, dress, uh, modern, uh, modern uh, modernization, if you will just uh, an exciting culture. So he did go uh, to Stockton. I'm in Southern California now, but he did go to Stockton. And uh, that was a place where a migrant 
a migrant, and particularly a migrant Filipino, had a network and could get jobs working in the fields. So he decided he would go on to um, Bible, uh, Bible school. He, he became what he called a, uh, became a Christian, decided to pursue that, decided to become a minister and went back to San Francisco to uh, go to a, a Protestant ministerial school. And then it was located on, uh, uh, in San Francisco itself, the street I forget, but it was Bethany Temple, a four-year college. He graduated from that and in the process came, uh, met my mother who, as I said earlier, uh, had chosen um, a religious way of life to, uh, she was more of a evangelist and a minister, a pastor in a church in Illinois. She came from Illinois had come out to visit the denomination at a convention in San Francisco. And there she met my father. Uh, so together they decided to come to Stockton, California and make a home. So they, they married, but uh, starting with this process of a Filipino and a Caucasian woman, blonde, blue eyed, by law could not get married in California or Stockton, but the state of California by virtue of their laws, uh, the miscegenation law, which forbid uh, interracial marriages, <clears throat> particularly of white and brown, or even um, Filipino and Mexican and others. So consequently, my uh, parents went to Lordsburg, New Mexico to get a marriage license. And uh, my father tells the story of going into a restaurant in Lordsburg, New Mexico. And I guess it was a common place for people to go to get a marriage license who are of mixed, mixed cultures and color. And he was accosted in a restaurant there by a Caucasian fellow who, um, expressed his disagreement with uh, interracial marriage and why they were there. And uh, I guess that came to a uh, amicable, however, uh, understanding. And they did get their marriage license, come back to Stockton. And they were married in the church in Stockton. It was a Filipino church at the time, which was uh, founded by Filipinos, many of them Ilocano, and the church itself was located at 311 South Center Street, right in the area where uh, Stocktonians now uh, of the Filipino culture and history uh, identify as Little Manila. At the time, uh, when I heard uh, Lois in her presentation talk about Skid Row, uh, 311 South Center and, Man and Little Manila was in the heart of Skid Row. Uh, there were um, a lower socioeconomic uh, class that hung out there. Uh, the Filipinos, however, did hang, up, hang out on El Dorado, El Dorado Street. So uh, that's how I came to be born there. I first went home from St. Joseph Hospital in Stockton to 311 South Center. And uh, that was my first home. My parents eventually built a home in South Stockton and that's where I grew up. I was happy to, uh, to grow up there because it was a, so, a mixed but lower socioeconomic area, uh, black, brown, Filipino, some whites and uh, it uh, gave me a opportunity to mix with other people, but I wasn't well out of my element. I was within my element of other minorities and other Filipino children and mestizos like myself, just struggling to interface into uh, the American culture. Um, growing up in Stockton, I'll talk about uh, 
that was a town at the time of about uh, 300,000 people. Uh, it was basically agricultural in nature and still is. Uh, so consequently, a lot of the Filipinos, as I said earlier, uh, did go there so they could get work because they worked with farm implements and farm doing farm labor. And my father worked uh, and tells stories of going all the way from the Coachella Valley down in Imperial County to Biggs up north of Sacramento um, <clears throat> to work. So eventually my father did uh, find, a, find work, but my mother and he had a struggle uh, both economically and with living in the community in many ways. And my father was very sensitive to um, in, innuendos of racism um, <clears throat> that were belabored upon him verbally by other uh, Caucasians in the community. But uh, still, my father uh, was able to adapt. He was able to uh, work uh, there. He uh, ended up with a civil service job. My mother, however, uh, was a, a homemaker. And uh, my mother bettered herself educationally, but she did not go to work. Um, one of the, uh, the, the areas that um, kind of caused me some, some um, dilemma was how teachers would say to me, oh, you're, and as I went to school, particularly younger, oh, he is, and say to my parents, he is very bright, or say to me, you're very bright. Uh, you should become a lawyer, a doctor. Um, and uh, I listened to that and, and uh, I was too naive to even be egotistical about it because I was thinking, I don't even know if I'm going to make it through school. Uh, we're relatively poor. Uh, how, would, how would this ever happen for me? And uh, so consequently, that was my outlook on it. Uh, as far as uh, discrimination goes, that was a struggle as well because there were enough Caucasian students in the school that I went to and schools that I went to at that age up to um, the grammar school uh, to make snide remarks about uh, ethnicity, uh, referring to me as a quote unquote chink, uh, slant eyes, uh, even a monkey. So uh, consequently, I, I remember coming from a, a religious family and in the first grade, I was uh, soft and gentle, and I would be, I would cry uh, sometimes when people said things like that to me. But as time went on, uh, I remember from the second grade on through the rest of grammar school, I became a rather um, aggressive person when uh, when older older boys or other boys would uh, say mean things about me. And I had gotten to the point where I enjoyed fighting. And <laughs> my mother, my mother hated that. And, uh, but, so I tried not to displease my parents because they wanted a better life for me. Uh, so I got over and through that, went on through, uh, through school. Uh, but in Stockton, there was a dividing line on the north end of town. And uh, it was referred to as a Mason-Dixon line. And that's in a racial sense that Filipinos and Browns, and particularly Filipinos, because I'm aware of that culture, were not, uh, not allowed to purchase property or would, nor would they be shown property by real estate agents uh, north of that party way area. So that was the, the kind of environment I grew up in. Uh, if you went further 
north, and we did venture north of uh, Stockton and uh, in those times, it was a Sunday right after church. So coming out of church, uh, feeling good uh, about the world around you and worshiping, uh, worshiping, you get in the car and you travel north of town, going out to in the country uh, to be greeted by people who would uh, uh, shout racial indignities at you. And, uh, but anyway, we enjoyed our Sunday. But consequently, I did make it through school. I didn't know how I was going to get through uh, to college or even go to college. Uh, it was ironic because we had a career day. So career day, uh, I said, well, they said, what do you want to be? Well, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I had did not have any good counseling uh, in terms of vocational counseling. My parents were not the best mentors uh, in that sense. So uh, I told them I wanted to be a, an aeronautical electronic engineer. And it was a long title and every, uh, all my fellow students were amazed by that. I really didn't know what uh, one of those jobs entailed at the time. So, uh, but I continued on into school. Uh, what I found was I didn't, find myself, others, others did well, other minorities, especially the Filipino uh, mestizo culture, some of them did very well in terms of getting through school. Uh, for me, it was a struggle uh, going to college. I did start junior college and then I ended up in the, in the military. And that was a good thing for me because in the military, I found that uh, you assimilate with a, a number of other cultures, other people, people from different socioeconomic levels, and you kind of go on. Um, <clears throat> so that was one thing. But then I, I looked forward to getting out of the service, and I thought I made up my mind that if I did, I would go back to college, and I wouldn't waste time, and I wouldn't fool around and uh, I would be a serious student. So I was able to, to uh, graduate from San Joaquin Delta College there in Stockton uh, with an AA. And actually I ended up eventually with a bachelor's and a master's in public administration. But the uh, Associate of Arts degree there at San Joaquin Delta College uh, was, I believe, one of the critical elements uh, of growing up assimilating into the American culture and in education and finding my way in, in uh, America. <clears throat> now, I um, found when I worked in an, and I worked in a nor large organization of 40, about 40,000 employees. And I made my way from, uh, from the bottom level up through the, the top of the field command in the California Department of Corrections. But what I found about people in business was that you may put that behind you, you may assimilate, you may feel American, but others, especially of the Caucasian culture, were always suspicious of you when you went into a new venue, you went into a new career, or a new, uh, new job. And the overall tone was that uh, they didn't, tr didn't trust you. Uh, they said, well, he's different. Uh, he doesn't understand. Uh, he, he don't know. He doesn't have the experience, no matter how much experience you have or how much preparation you have for yourself. But uh, I was able to put that behind me. Uh, what I, what I chose to do was uh, to overcome my deficiencies as a uh, minority and as a Filipino Caucasian mestizo was I just tried to get the best education to be as well qualified in the field that I was in for 33 years when I finally retired. And uh, just to be a good example and put discrimination behind me. Uh, so 
more recently, I think Dr. Tanasa has talked about being at a place where I think he was insane in the in Asia, but in Stockton, I went back to Stockton, California, after being gone many years, and I went to sell uh, to a um, breakfast at a, um, a restaurant, and I saw there. Uh, a couple of Filipino Asian looking employees in the front. They were smiling, they were laughing, they were waiting on customers and they looked like me. And you know, that's the same impression I got. Jeez, these people look like me. I'm home. Uh, where have I been all this time? So, un but until that, uh, I had felt that I really was just out in the world on my own by myself. Uh, I wasn't particularly struggling because in any adventure that I went into, I became rather successful. I had a broker's license and still have a real estate broker's license having been grandfathered in. I had that for 35 years. I was a successful personal, personal uh, real estate investor and, and also a broker associate and a, a top listing agent for two years in a row. So I was successful in interfacing, I will say that, as I share with you. Uh, I went from a position, I worked all positions in corrections from correctional officer to warden. Uh, so I did have some successes, but uh, <clears throat> the one thing that, uh, that I did want to share is that it's important to do as much in closing here. I felt it was important to prepare yourself to take on additional tasks, to be an example uh, to others uh, that you were, you do understand, you do have wisdom, you do have knowledge, you do have patience, um, and you do have a wherewithal to survive struggles and to be successful. And then, to go on and mentor others. And I believe that mentoring others is really important because I didn't have that much mentoring behind me. Um, <clears throat> I do belong to a number of organizations now in the community and uh, back to interfacing. Um, I, I would say and suggest to others who uh, listen to this presentation that they can Look at themselves and look at others and see what they can do for others. Certainly prepare yourself to see what you can do to help others. Uh, because when my father came the thousands of miles from the Philippines and my mother came from where she came in the Midwestern part of the United States to California, there were not those people that were there to help and mentor and guide them. Anyway, that is my presentation. And thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson and uh, Fons for allowing this opportunity. Okay, I think the, the speakers will have to have a little uh, conversation on our own. But meanwhile, there are a number of people listening in and would like to ask if any of the audience have questions for any of the speakers or comments? I would just like to say that I thank them for their presentations. I think they were all very good, very enlightening because we that are not mestizos <laughs> have uh, opened our eyes to what even you as mixed race have uh, things the problems that you face and to find out some of your history of your parents. I think that's, that's very good that you have now uh, have this interest and you know, I think you, you will be able to be more understanding of your own self because you know the background of your parents and that that is part of you. I think your presentations were very good. Thank you. Very 
Marilyn has a question. You've discovered yourself. Hi, everybody. This is Marilyn. Uh, yeah, this was wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Um, and I, I agree with Mr. Filon, who said, um, think about the next generation. There are so many kids in the US, as you know, and elsewhere in the world, uh, struggling, feeling discriminated against justifiably. And um, I think it would be wonderful to find a way to share these kinds of stories with them. But I really appreciate um, everybody's presentation. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Marilyn was uh, very important in Fonz some years ago when she was at the Hagen Museum. She helped us a lot. Thank you, Marilyn. It was my pleasure. And I, Letty. <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Thank you. So, anybody else have questions or comments? I just want to say to Alfonso, uh, I grew up in Stockton. I was born here, but I believe I had seen your parents often at the mission. Uh, when the mission was on Lafayette Street and you said your parents got married on center. So I had been to that church a couple of times because I became Presbyterian and had the Filipino church on Hunter and Sonora. So I'm the last charter member of the Trinity Presbyterian Church. By the way, we're going to be celebrating our 80th birthday this October. So anyway, I believe I, not that I knew your parents, but I saw them. Thank you. Yes, and they were very dedicated to their ministry. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Eunice, Catherine? I think their presentation with the PowerPoint or whatever they were using was very good too. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. Are you presenting this in Seattle, this way? Yes, we, we're going to be presenting in Seattle, but it's going to have to be somewhat abbreviated since we have a limited amount of time for all of us to speak. That's um, great. And we need I wish I could be there. Well, come along. I wish. Zoomy. <laughs> uh -huh. Sorry, okay. I thought that... Thank so, you. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Yosa, Eunice, or Eunice. Thank you, Ka uh, Catherine. Thank you, Marilyn. Is Marilyn still here? Thank you, Auntie Letty. You're welcome. For being here. I enjoyed it. Okay, thank you, everybody. everybody. Enjoyed all your stories. The other side here, there were other people here that we missed. So sorry. There was a Ruben. Was he going to speak? Is that Ruben Salazar? He's gone, though. Uh -huh. Okay, well, goodbye. Thank you for Alaska. I think that was interesting. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>